Now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, to Barbara Revuelta Eogercios. She is an associate, an associate research professor at the Danish National Archives and at the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. And I think after the two presentations we've had already, you might not think that it could be, uh, that it could get more exciting, but I guess it can get more exciting, or even as excited as it has been, because <laughs> now now we we we, we will uh, we will have a presentation that deals with uh, with the automated reconstruction of life courses of persons out of various sources from the 19th century. So I think. Yeah, we are very curious of what you are going to tell us, Barbara. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and I, I hope I, I live up to the hype <laughs> now. And thank you very much to the organization for letting me come here and enjoy these days and, and talk about our, our child, uh, the Link Lives Project. And um, to, to, to say it briefly, uh, our, I'm missing my PowerPoint, but I can start <laughs> speaking. <laughs> Um, the Link Lives project is a cross-disciplinary research project that uh, combines uh, diverse uh, uh, information from archival sources and it makes it into life courses that refer to individual persons in the past, builds relationships that allow us to create different generations, and we do that for the whole population starting in 1787, the first nationwide uh, Danish census, up to connecting to modern sources. And it is a collaboration from the National Archives of Denmark, Copenhagen City Archives, and the University of Copenhagen, both historians and people from bioinformatics. And we have some other collaborators that I will talk to you about later. But let me start by telling you why do we need this project. And there's at least two user groups that are really in need of help from the archive, but they don't quite get what they need. So one of them is this fictional um, uh, user, but with a very real problem, Hannah, who is a, a PhD student in the humanities or social sciences in Denmark. And she has read this new research that comes about uh, in investigating the intergenerational factors that explain our biological and social life. So she has read papers, as you can see here, looking at some American research that shows that conditions in early life, in the early 20th century, have consequences seven decades later in your political affiliation, but are not only on your own life course. Experiences of a child in early 20th, 20th century in Sweden, being born out of a wedlock, has health consequences for his offspring and also for the grandchildren generation. And if you go to Canadian data, you can see that church book data over 400 years show exciting connections between the fertility of the frontier population and all the generation afterwards. So our Hannah would be completely amazed about this new field of research and consider, can this be done in Denmark? And she would be really happy to see that the, we have the, the CPR registry, a uh, civil registration that started in 1968. From that point onwards, and, and there's similar in Norway and Sweden, we have these Scandinavian registries where everyone has been assigned one unique ID and all administrat administrative records are connected to that. So we can do that, and we can go back a couple of uh, generations. But can we go further? So our Hannah would go online and Google the hell out of things and be completely amazed about the amount of images that are spread across of all sources covering all sorts of dimensions of life at the Danish National Archives, city archives, municipal archives, local archives, but not only that. There will be images, but also transcriptions. There's millions of records uh, transcribed already by volunteer projects that started almost 30 years ago. And then you've got the big players, Ancestry also, launching web pages. Lots of genealogy uh, created forums and web pages. And also a lot of researchers and health researchers that have already transcribed amazing sources for the 20th century. So she would be completely excited, but simultaneously it would be impossible for her to handle all this. For a, for a PhD, but also for a single project. This is too much to, to handle. So I think that our Hannah would probably end up just trying to get some Canadian or Swedish data. And then meet Hans, who would be some, some person who has not a clear connection to history, but it's with the event of the birth of his grandson, he would think, I want to do my own family tree. I've heard all this hype. So he would just Google 
how to get started with this, and would be just showered also with options. But the first one would be my heritage. It's like, oh, this is cool, that it seems easy, but then, bam, the paywall. No, 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 no. there must be public sources. So he would, do, he would do about the same thing as Hannah, and it would be, again, showered with the amount of possibilities, and every link would give you to other links and to many other things. Why are there the same sources in different collections? So this is really difficult. And for most Hanses, that would be a deal breaker. Like, I don't have time to deal with this. So maybe when we retire. So we've sort, sort of lost two users that could actually really benefit from these digital treasures of the Danish archives. And in short, what we do with Link Lives is try to help them out on their way and trying to provide them with the, with the things that they need in the way that they need it. And in doing so, we try also to cater to some of the people that actually don't know that they need us, but they actually would benefit very much. So, so in short, what we do is collect different historical sources already transcribed. Our project is really looking forward with all these HDR developments, but we only work with things that have already been transcribed in any way. We process, we transform them so that they, so we can make them into uh, live courses and into intergenerational data. That is what we call Link Life's Links, our main data repository. And then we disseminate it to these two user groups. On the one hand side, to the Hanses, through a web page where everyone can interact with the material. And then to the Hanas, through uh, what we call science, in which they could get a tailored data structure, getting exactly all the things that they need for their own intergenerational research. Um, this is very beautiful, but as many projects like this, you aggregate data, this can become a data cemetery. The moment that you are done, the project dies with you. So what we have thought and what we try, and being part of the National Archives and having a, a design in which we, we want to project <laughs> over our own the death of the project and find a way so that sources that we know that are happening through the crowdsourcing, which is still ongoing, more than one million records are transcribed every year in Denmark can be integrated. And also there's researchers transcribing their own data. So if we build, we, we want to build a system that can dynamically integrate as many sources as become available to enrich further and further this uh, data infrastructure that we have to leave forever <laughs> at the National Archives. So we try to make it a living data structure. And this is possible because we got funding from, <laughs> from two major donors. We have given us up to 4.5 million euros, the, uh, the Innovation Fund Denmark and the Casper Foundation. That, ha that is what allows that the that na National Archives and the university can engage in this type of project. But let me tell you about uh, exactly what we're doing so you get a bit of a sense. So right now we are linking three types of sources each of them have been transcribed by a different institution, and it comes with a completely different set. So we have the National Archives census transcribed by this project that I mentioned earlier. It started transcribing in 1992. So 1992, they had to just do it out of paper. Imagine a transcription project that has lasted over 30 years. There's more than 20 million records. All the census, well, 10 censuses in the 19th century in Denmark have been fully transcribed. Um, and that is an extraordinary repository. But we also have the parties records that we have obtained from an, the company Ancestry, which, was, which has made them available for us. They have indexed, so it's not full transcription, but the main information, it is there, from um, 1812 to 1882, and in some cases going to 1911. And we also have the Copenhagen City Archives. They have their own transcription project. It is a, it's a younger project, but it is already 10 years old, so <laughs> not that young anymore. So they are also uh, provided it's hundreds of thousands of death certificate, uh, burial certificates for the city of Copenhagen, which have causes of death, which are extremely important for health research. So that is what we're doing, and we will be done by that in February 2022. And we have a second part of the project that deals into the newer data. We go into the 20th century with more censuses and the connection to the civil registry of 1968. So we can bridge um, the gap between the more historical data where the GDPR protections are not applying up to the data that comes really rich. And after 2024, but still already now, we're trying to find ways of integrating other collections uh, created by crowdsourcing at our own archives. Both National Archives and City Archives have already 
um, large collections that just they are waiting still to, to be trans uh, included into linked lives, but also from other other archives and other cultural institutions. So this could be this could be open for all types of records about people to be included. Um, because we have all this crowdsourcing, we have all operations, but we also have researchers very much, like our Hannah, <laughs> interested in that. And that has actually led to some recent fundings on, on projects that have to do with this historical uh, transcription. There's a uh, project that is going to look into the transcription of Paris records from 1920 to 1968. Uh, through HDR technologies. We're really, really looking forward for them to, to be done so these sources can be incorporated. So you can see that this, uh, the, the, the potential for growth is extraordinary, and the more that we go into the 20th century, the more that we can cover not only the classical historical issues, but more modern considerations. So in order to do that, we had to create a group that can deal with that. So we have a combination of people from the different institutions and a combination between historical archival and data science approaches. So to just to give you an example, we, the, the core group, we have a bunch of historians and some programmers who, who work on Python. So we have developed the term PyHistorians <laughs> in order to just have this common understanding of who we are and how it is not the data scientists on their own, the historians on their own, it is us working together as these PyHistorians who can actually deliver on these results. And uh, yeah, so let me just walk you briefly through some of the main uh, elements of the project, so I'll go through the, some of the methods and data, and then how we're disseminating them specifically. Um, and you probably have realized that when I talked about linked data in this context, I'm not talking about open linked data or the semantic web, I'm just talking about the very basic um, fact that we take one record from, from one source and then we can connect to another record in another source, and developing who is the best match per se, it is what we're concerned with here. And when we, when we add up all those links and we change them together, we create a live course. And, and here we have an example of Niels Nielsen. That was the, the very first uh, automatic algorithm uh, created live course that we had. But the very important thing here is that we create these live courses, but, and we have different methods to do that, but there's no ground truth for us. So there is no way that we will ever know if this life course is correct or not. We will have plenty of evidence, and it could look like to us that this has to be, but there's, there's no formal ground truth. So all our methods are best estimations that could work up for the better, for worse, for different purposes. And I think that has been something key in this field, where many researchers, we think that the best estimates come from humans. And, but it is very time intensive to create the, the, the data by humans. So many researchers and many groups have relied on, on samples of convenience, some, something that someone linked for a PhD or for a small project, or harvesting some data out of the internet from genealogies, and just finding some sources or just trying to make them work so that you can test your algorithms in them. We have gone the other way because we wanted to know as, as humans, our historians, how do we link? What is that we consider that it is a good link? Can we consider a good link? So we developed um, um, a, a computer-assisted application to, in order to uh, help our historians to link. And we have developed a system where we have two independent linkers that look at the same thing, and then they give their uh, independent answer. Uh, there's the disagreements between them are solved by a third person. And that we have, as, as of now, 35,000 records that link different, uh, so different types of sources, but also different chronologies and different geographies, because we need to, for our algorithms to be trained or to be able to test our models properly, we need to know how the, the, the variety of the underlying sources. And one thing that was exceptional to find is like, yes, humans link about the same, but there's something like between a 5 and 15% of links where there's disagreements. So, so that we have a third person who decides what it is a link for the purposes of link lives, but we also add this information about uncertainty of options as part of our training data set so that we can exploit also this uh, variability. Obviously, we have also developed these rule-based uh, algorithms that is pretty straightforward to do. So we have historians and data scientists coming up with some rules. The name has to be similar, the place has to be similar, the age has to be similar, and that is the link. But of course, the devil is in the details, like what do we mean with similar and how we compute that? How, how much can we deviate from a name 
so that we can keep capturing the right person but not get someone else. And our methods are kind of okay, much better than we expected. So we can have a, a recall of around 70% with a, an, a precision of about 95, which is really, really decent for these type of things. Um, but of course, now it is all <laughs> about machine learning. So we're also uh, taking all this hard work and expensive training data that we have produced to get into um, our linking machine and then produce links for the whole population so that we can offer our users different ways of uh, linking. So I have not written any numbers there because it's still in a preliminary so we, situation. We just got our training data enough to start these um, tests. We tried random forest, uh, support vector machine, and different unsupervised methods. And so I don't want to give any numbers, but they seem to be per outperforming rule base. And that is what we expected. It is very difficult to program all the different exceptions and all the rules. So it, was, it is relatively straightforward for the algorithms to at least outperform rule based uh, um, approaches. Um, however, it is a question that we have a very unbalanced relationship. We, there's only there's fewer links, like everything in, in a thesis, every, everyone is not match. You only find one right link. So, so it, it, we have to be sure that we train the machine with the right sets in order to get the, um, the, the best results. But, um, but we're, we're really, really hoping to be able to give our users precisely not only one method, but several families of methods with several implementations with different use of variables so that they can choose exactly what it is that they want to use, uh, they want to see, depending on how they want to use it. And this comes to one of the main uh, sort of tenets of, of what we do in Link Lives. It is that that decision it is just one part of a, of a long list of decisions. There's a, there's a long way uh, between the historical reality that gave rise to a source to their research article that our Hannah could write. So there's been all sorts of changes happening to the data, all sorts of decisions by human and by computers, from the people who decided that something had to be counted, to how it was counted, to the, to the actual transmission to the paper, preservation, digitalization, the transcription projects, and then we come in and have our own uh, decisions and our own imprint on the data. So, so we are really obsessed with metadata, we just being able to trace everything so that that it is very clear how the data and how is the reliability on what are the limits to inference on the material. Um, so that is you know, in a nutshell what we do when, in, in Link Life's Links. And I would like to show you how our web page is looking. Uh, right now, um, we are expecting to launch in January 2022, but we have an operational prototype with uh, full implementation. It is just missing the, the, the last good batches of data and uh, the last user test. But it just it is a sort of a regular search function. Sorry, this in Danish, but it's just you have to put name, place of birth, and a year or an age to be able to start searching. So then you input these at least three values, and you would get into some kind of a landing page like this, where you would be shown with uh, all the different, uh, what we call person appearances, every time a person shows up in a source, in a census, in a burial, in a marriage, along with the live courses that we are created. And here you have them in blue. So you would be able to test, okay, I want to see your live courses, but also I can see what sources are there. So if you click on blue, uh, you would go into one of our reconstructed live courses. And here with colors and with different graphic patterns, you would see this is the person that we think uh, that all these records seem to be probable from the same person. And more importantly, to the right-hand side, you see a, um, a blue box that I do not expect you to read. But that is where we add how we got to this decision. Every single link will be, will be displaying this particular information. And you may think that maybe genealogists are not very interested in knowing that, but we are very interested in them knowing how we got to things. So we, aim, we do not aim to be right. We just aim to tell you this is how we got to this solution. We hope that it helps. And further, uh, we're hoping that they help us back in a way. The genealogist community is, and, and these volunteers who have been involved in these sources, they are extremely generous with their time. They are so engaged, so they're going to want us to give us a lot of feedback. And we want to get it in the most structured way. So people will be able to click when they're locked in, and we have their proper metadata. They will be able to say to us, I don't think this is a good link. Those are the reasons, or this is a good link. Those are the reasons. 
that type of data uh, will not be the same as our original domain expert, double person linked data. But we think that if we collect it in, in su insufficient size and with sufficient variety and scope, it can give us completely different insights to this way of uh, looking at life courses. And, and this is also fully, like it's fully operational, just waiting for us to send the last batch uh, of data to them. On the other hand, we have science. And then uh, that's going to be a very um, basic uh, way of downloading data for researchers. The way that we're envisaging right now by February 2020, it is just a web page where you just can download everything that we can possibly give you with all the metadata and all the documentation that we can probably give you. And that's going to put a limit on who can use it. So only people with have enough programming competences to download so many gigas and make sense of them will be able to access it. But right now we're just looking into, we're waiting for to hear from some funding and see if we can actually make that also into, into easier ways so that we can engage all the people, historians and, and high school students that could have an easier access. But a key, a key part of doing science, it is also doing research. As I said, we are a research project. We are researching on the methods and testing how we develop these historical methods. But also we, we, with our partners, are also researching on things that can be done with the resulting data. And we think this is key so that we, because data is created and linked data is created for a reason. So we need to be sure that, well, it works for some of the reasons. We cannot just anticipate everything, but, but it is very important for us to be able to, to have this loop where we test some of the things that happen and, and we test the feedback back into the process of development and the research that we, the new insights that we gain can also go back into the process. So we have something like 10 papers that are just waiting for us to have time to <laughs> sit down and write them. So just to finish up, uh, hopefully I've convinced you this opens up enormous new opportunities of research that are not only for Denmark, but also for international researchers. We give opportunities to the free access to this data that ha it is for us a way to give back for all those people that have used so much time in transcribing data, so we give them an easy interface into their sources. For the archives, it is a way of dissemination and engagement that is completely different than they've had before, an opportunity to move into this direction. And we do hope that we can also open a way to collaboration with other archives, not, not our current partners, but also further collaboration. And obviously, I'm not claiming that this is the, the unique or the only one thing. Uh, there's many researchers and archives, there's many elements that have been uh, put together outside. We think the strength is that the preconditions of the data, the data availability, but also the partnership between the university and the different archives, it is what gives us strength because it allows us to, to there's this, this, this corpus of data that so many people are interested in, so we find a way of sort of answering to, to both group um, simultaneously. So, so we think that that is sort of part of the beauty, and that is why we're so excited to, to be all this hard work for others. It is so extremely amazing for us to work in, so, and, and, and to then get them to be able to use the material that we produce. So thank you. Thank you very much for that highly impressive presentation. And if I may add something to the value and beneficiary, uh, beneficiaries, I think a project like yours uh, has a huge societal impact yep. because it tears down the barriers to historical information of concrete persons totally and enables the whole society to get into uh, historical mm -hmm. research and even to get emotionally, t emotionally touched you can reach the citizens' hearts because any, almost any Danish citizen finds his or her ancestors in that database. And I think uh, that's really a means how history can get into each living room very, very easily. And that's the way uh, we should, should do that. Any questions? Um, so I think we all need a coffee. We are a little bit in delay, but uh, just one, uh, one, one question. Um, you, you mentioned the, um, uh, the, the link domain experts. Mm -hmm. Who are they? Are they uh, citizens, uh, scientists, oh, yeah. or are they professionists? Because yeah. I guess you need yeah, many absolutely. of them. Um, so it's 
it's um, historians that we have working for the project. So we, we actually we, we sat down and we had some people who had uh, developed their own uh, one of our one of the images there is uh, Esbjorn Thompson who actually did his own PhD and he did that for three parishes. So he brought with him all the knowledge of how to do this uh, for your own research. So we could took, took the, we take that as like, okay, so how do we use your knowledge in order to make it in a way that, that, it, that it works through sources and that we can train all the people. So we've had the research assistant and we have all the people during Corona. So we got five uh, employees from the National Archives that also were added to the team. So we were running a linking school with, uh, with some guidelines and with follow up. And so, so we, we have developed sort of a, a process to, to ensure that we, we know that the, the solution, the, the end result is not necessarily the, the right one, but it is one that is um, that systematically and all the that we and we keep an eye on, on if we suddenly we are changing our way of linking. But uh, but it is all history trained uh, professionals at this point. But we think that these gene genealogies would come with a, a slightly different way of going about it that would also be helpful to incorporate sort of later on when, mm -hmm. once we know exactly how we historians that we are we know what we're doing exactly and and how we're doing. Um, what it means for us. And one last quick question. Um, um, do you intend to extend the project uh, after you have finished the 19th century also to the previous centuries? Because you have parish registers already in the 17th and 18th century and there is a lot of data, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's not a, a systematic. It's not a systematic, but uh, there's uh, there's obviously talks about it. Uh, we are not a specialist on that, but we're talking with a specialist on, on that, and and sort of hope we're sort of waiting to release at least part of this data so that people can we get a bit of a pass and say like, okay, now we, we are continuing like forward, but there's also space to be backwards, mm -hmm. and and we would be and we would need these 18th century and 17th century experts to tell us how we go about the sources um, so that we can sort of replicate the process. But but uh, yes, we think that this uh, the way that we build it is like we just need more sources and more people to to be able to put it mm -hmm. together. Great, thank you. Thank so. You. Thank you very much all to all four speakers for those highly inspiring and, and wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I think the delay is not so much, so 20 minutes for coffee mm -hmm. will be sufficient. Let's meet again as it is planned at 11.30 here in this room. 35, okay, 11.35. <laughs>